Okay, well, um, hi everybody uh, and welcome. Thank you so much for, for sticking around for, I guess, the, the last presentation in the day. It's been a really great showcase so far and I'm really excited to be part of it and I guess uh, your, your closing act for today. Uh, so my name is Allison Hosier and I am, and I am the head of information literacy at the University of Albany, and I'm here today to talk to you about an idea that I've been playing around with in some of my teaching, uh, including my tutorials, one-shot sessions, and my credit-bearing course for the last few years, which is that as information literacy instructors, we're used to thinking and talking about the skills and knowledge that students lack when it comes to research and information literacy or what they get wrong. But what if we start thinking instead about how to leverage the expertise that they have to better engage them in our lessons? So to answer that question, I'm going to first offer a very brief bit of background, and then I'm going to take you through a quick activity similar to one that I've used in various teaching scenarios. Um, and the activity consists of asking just some uh, reflection-based questions, and you'll have the opportunity to participate using the chat feature if you'd like. Uh, and even though this is a lot to go through and our time is relatively short, I do tend to talk fast, as you can probably already tell. Uh, so there should be time at the end for questions as well. So because today's session is relatively short, I just want to say up front uh, that what I'm going to be talking about today uses some of the ideas from a book I re recently published called uh, Using Context in Information Literacy Instruction as a Foundation. So I'm not going to go into these ideas from this book in too much depth because of the time constraints, and I know we're kind of getting toward the end here, uh, but if you don't mind the self-plug, I wanted to let you know about the book in case uh, what I talk about does interest you and you want to learn more, and I'll also show this again at the end just in case. But the main idea of the book is this idea that research, uh, when it comes to research, context matters. Uh, context affects everything about the research process, including what level of authority is considered acceptable in a source, what types of sources we use, where we look for those sources, and how we practice the ethical use of information. So what this means is that there are many different types of research. Uh, I've come up with some broad categories, which you can see here on this slide. And this isn't meant to capture every type of research there is. And obviously, there's going to be some crossover between the types of research that I've named. But I think this list is useful as a starting point for thinking about six very broad types of research, uh, including academic research, creative research, personal research, professional, professional research, scholarly research, and scientific research. So as information literacy instructor, instructors, our main focus is generally on academic research, specifically college level academic research. So we're teaching students the skills and knowledge they need to be successful as academic researchers, because that's what's gonna help them meet their most information, most immediate information needs. And arguably it's also what best supports the missions and values of the institutions that we work in. So students especially need this instruction uh, when they're new to academic research, when they're maybe taking on a college level research assignment for the first time. And they need to know what scholarly sources are and how to navigate library databases and how to cite their sources because all of those skills are associated with the type of academic research that they're doing. But even though students are new to college level academic research, they're not new to research entirely. Uh, so as we all know, they have plenty of experience with personal research. They may also have experience with creative research, which is research undertaken to enhance a creative work. And depending on their age and their life experience, they may also have some experience with professional research. And of course, they have experience with high school level academic research as well. So obviously, the practices and conventions of one type of research are going to be different from the conventions and practices of another type. So for example, you wouldn't necessarily need to use peer reviewed sources for personal research or creative research, or even professional research, depending on what your job is. But even though the practices and conventions may be different, it's important to remember that the skills and concepts gained from experience in one context can serve as a useful foundation when approaching a new context. Now, this is a little different from how we often frame what we teach to students. Uh, we do spend a lot of time, or at least I do sometimes, I'm guilty of this, spend a lot of time kind of shaking our finger at them, telling them that they can't just use any old website for their college research assignment, 
or that they can't use Google to search for sources. Uh, and we tend to treat the skills and knowledge they already have from their experience with, for example, personal research as bad habits that need to be corrected. So we act as if we're teaching them the right way to do research in general, when in reality, we're really only teaching them the right way to do research in this one context, one which comes with very specific and rigid conventions and practices that are very different from research in other contexts. So we tell them more or less to forget what they already know about research. When, let me see here, just got lost just a second here. When really we should be teaching them how to recognize, use, and adapt what they learn from past research experience to this new context, because what they know is actually quite valuable. It doesn't need to be corrected, it just needs to be adapted. So how do we do this? So to show you, I'm gonna use an example activity that I developed for a lesson for our educational opportunity program in summer 2020. So the audience for that lesson was students in the summer program who were about to start their first year of college. And I've also used a version of this in my credit bearing information literacy course, and I've written about it in a couple of different places. So I start the activity by asking students to imagine the following. Imagine that your favorite musical artist has just come out with a new album. You listen to their new music and you love it so much that you wanna find out everything you can about how the album was made, including what influenced the article, the artist, and what the inspirations were behind their songs. So you go to Google and you look up interviews with the artist and reviews from well-known entertainment news sites. You also read social media posts and watch videos from fellow fans who analyze the new songs endlessly, speculating about what they mean and how they relate to the artist's previous work. All of this information influences your own thinking about the new album and makes you even more excited about it. You might even participate in the conversation by posting a video or comment uh, to share your own thoughts. So after giving students this example, I ask them, did you do research? And now some might argue with me, but I believe that the answer is yes. Uh, this is in fact, an example of a research activity, though not one that students would do for a college level research assignment. Instead, this is an example of personal research. It's one that students are likely to be familiar with even if they haven't been in this exact scenario before. And it's also one that uses a lot of skills that are likely to be important when they start to take on college level academic research. So now I'm gonna ask you, just like I asked them, what do you think those skills are? So based on the example, which I'll copy and paste in the chat in case you wanna see it again, or your own experience, what skills do you think students have from doing personal research that might be valuable to academic research? So take a minute to think about it. And if you have some ideas, feel free to share them in the chat. Okay. All right, so we have using trusted sources, looking at a variety of sources, tenacity, I like that one. Any other ones we can think of? Someone who's post speed, yeah. So I'm just gonna post the example in the chat right now, it's a little long. But yeah, finding a topic that interests them, using less traditional sources as a jumping off point, examining the reliability of a source. Let's see, there are a few I missed a second ago. Exploration and resilience to find questions, answers to their questions, that's great. Using less traditional sources as a jumping off point, examining the reliability, the joy of that sweet find, yes. <laughs> All right, verifying with other sources. Yeah, so there are a lot of skills here that we're coming up with uh, that students have developed from personal research, either from the example or from our own thinking about personal research that might be valuable to their academic research. And so when I do this, you know, I have students kind of brainstorm answers just like I've asked you and yeah, joining the conversation, using information to develop their own perspective and thoughts. These are great ideas. All right, so after we talk about it a little, here's what I tell them, I, what I think the answer is. And I think some of these are reflected in your responses, but you've also come up with a lot of stuff that I'm definitely gonna be uh, adding to, to my teaching as well. But some suggestions I make are that from personal research, students have learned something about how to make decisions about where to search for information and what type of information to search for. 
So in the example, the student chooses entertainment news sites rather than, for example, a library database or a regular news site because they know that this is the place that they're most likely to find the information they're interested in. They also choose to search social media when seeking the points of view of other fans, which is perfectly appropriate for this activity. And they have experience with making decisions about which sources to trust. Uh, on the entertainment news site, they're looking specifically for interviews with the artists because that point of view is likely to be an authoritative one for answering or for understanding the new album. But they also look to other fans and make decisions about which fan theories they agree with or seem trustworthy and which to dismiss. And less visible in this example, but certainly present in students' experience, is that at some point they probably had to revise or play around with a search when their original approach didn't get them the information they were looking for. They may have also revised the search as their understanding of a topic evolved. So now, to be sure, they may not have done this in the way that we as information literacy experts would prefer or recommend, uh, especially when it comes to making decisions about what information to trust. But the methods of the students used in the example were perfectly appropriate for personal research. And though the sources that they used in the topic they researched might not fit well with a college level research assignment, the skills they use to do this research are valuable to academic research. We're making choices about where to search, what information to trust, and being able to adjust your search as needed are all inevitable parts to the process. So the difference is that these parts might look different when you're doing a college level academic research assignment. So rather than searching Google or social media, you're going to search a library database, not because searching Google or social media is wrong, but because of the conventions of this particular research context require you to use sources that can only be found through library databases. And you're going to use those scholarly sources and you're not going to, and you're going to use those scholarly sources, not because using entertainment websites or social media is wrong in general. But because again, it doesn't fit with the conventions of this type of research. And also you need to use formal citation for your sources because giving credit in informal ways that may be more familiar from personal research, like linking back to the original source or simply mentioning it in a comment or video is what's required in this new context. So framing the lesson in this way changes it from one in which students are told research is something new or that the information seeking habits they've developed over the course of their lives are somehow wrong or in need of correction and instead frames it as one where you're learning to adapt what you know to conventions that may be unfamiliar and leverage the skills you already have in a new context. And by the way, this lesson works the other way too, uh, as far as getting students to think about how they can use what they learn from academic research and apply it to other research contexts. So what do you think those useful skills might be when it comes to personal research? If you wanna put, put some ideas in the chat, if you have any. Yeah, needing reliable sources, vetting sources, seeking out reliable sources, organizational skills, definitely. Better methods to evaluate sources, definitely, yep. Query structure, attribution. Boy, we're fast and furious. We know, we know some of these benefits really well. <laughs> uh, reliable sources, perseverance, definitely. Persistence, great. Any others that we can think of? Not just finding sources that support what they already think, definitely. More options for locating resources. Great. Advanced Google search strategies and database opportunities, definitely. Yes, asking for help when they need it, absolutely. Any other ideas? Using limiters, yep, definitely. So yeah, so there are a lot of skills and a lot of concepts uh, that you know we teach students to use as part of their academic research that might come in handy when they start doing other research or when they're you know to help enhance their personal research, understand the information cycle using different keywords. These are all great ideas. And so when I have students do this activity, this is usually what I I tell them some some ideas that I offer. Um, so I tell them searching a library database teaches you how to match a search tool to your information need, uh, which is a core skill associated with information literacy. 
So because it comes with certain conventions around what types of sources are considered appropriate and which are not, academic research also teaches you how to match a source of information to your information need. And while students may have learned how to make decisions about what sources to trust in their personal research, academic research teaches you to think more deeply and more critically about the quality of the information you use. It also teaches you to be fluent in different formats of information. So like high school French, uh, students may never use peer-reviewed sources again after they graduate, but learning about peer-reviewed sources can give them a better understanding of and appreciation for how information is produced and how to navigate different types of information. So you can also do this with professional research, getting students to think about professional research that they do for current or future jobs and how do they have the academic research skills or even their personal research skills maybe apply to those or the research that they do for more creative projects. So in my course, students seem to especially enjoy talking about the experience they have doing research for their creative activities, like art and writing and music and photography and even filmmaking. And it's really useful for them to think about what research in this context has in common with research in other contexts, but also how it's unique or different. So there are a lot of benefits, I think, to teaching this way, including that it gives students confidence in what they already know while also making it clear that there's more to learn. And from a lesson like this, students learn that their research experience is valuable, no matter what that experience look, might look like. And that's especially important, I think, for students who may come from backgrounds where they didn't have easy access to libraries or databases or even the internet because college level research that requires all of those things might feel especially new to them but they learn that their experience is just as valuable as anyone else's. And as I said, the great thing about this idea is that it can be used in any teaching situation. Uh, it doesn't have to be this exact activity, but just framing your teaching in a way that acknowledges and leverages the skills that students already have and treats those skills as valuable can be really beneficial. And it can be really eye-opening for students as well. I've gotten a lot of feedback from students in my course and in some of my one-shot sessions um, that they had never really thought about sort of their personal research as being research and some of the value that that can bring to, you know, their, uh, to their college level research uh, and the other way around as well. And it's just, it, they really seem to enjoy the opportunity to kind of talk about their more personal research activities as research and thinking about it in that way. And another benefit of this, I think, is that when you are doing it for something like a one-shot session, you don't necessarily need a lot of instructor buy-in. You don't even really need to clear it with them first. It's just something that you can do, that you can work in, that um, that is really easy to do and doesn't sort of require their permission in a way. Uh, I was really lucky when I developed uh, the, the original version of this lesson for our EOP students and our EOP faculty that um, they not only liked it, they, they actually encouraged me in this direction. Um, I wanted to teach this way, but I wasn't brave enough, so I showed them the script to a tutorial that was just sort of the regular kind of thing that I would teach, the, the normal spiel about databases and peer-reviewed sources and whatever, and they looked at it and said, well, actually, can you talk a little bit more about their research experience and how this relates to the experience that they might already have? And not make it sound like something brand new. So it was really great to, and that was something I was interested in doing anyway. So it was really freeing and great to be able to do that. So I did have their buy-in and they were really interested in that, in presenting that aspect of things. But even in a one-shot session where you, you know, if you have good communication with a professor, obviously, you know, something that you can talk about with them ahead of time, but it's not necessarily something that you need permission to do, I think. So it can be worked in even without um, a lot of buy-in or sort of prior buy-in, I guess, is what I mean. So, and even though I've mostly been talking about working with beginner level students, um, teaching like this can be valuable for more advanced students who are taking on discipline specific research for the first time, uh, because there are important differences between sort of the general research that students do at the beginner level and discipline specific research that requires the use of more specialized tools and sources. So you can kind of, you know, once students get to a more advanced level, they know a little bit, hopefully, about, you know, searching a database and what a peer-reviewed source is and what to look for or what a scholarly source is. But once they get to a discipline-specific research, they might be in different, more sophisticated databases. They may be working with more specialized resources. So teaching them how kind of their prior experience with those more beginner-level 
uh, research assignments applies and can be adapted to these more dis this more discipline specific advanced research is another way that this can be used if you tend to work with more advanced students rather than just beginner level ones. So I told you I talk fast. So that was a really quick example of how to think about and talk with students about the value of the research experience they already have. And again, the foundation for some of this is explained in more depth in my book, uh, if you're interested in this idea of the contextual nature of research. But even if you're not, I find that this really makes for an effective way to engage students in your teaching. So um, yeah, so are there any questions that I can answer before we wrap up? And, and please feel free also to email me after if you think of it. Lots of great comments here. Allison, your plug is working because now I'm dying to open your book. Oh, <laughs> there, there, there. Uh, luckily, there's a good number of copies in the system that can be requested if your library doesn't own it. <laughs> I'm checking right now. I'm sure we do have it. Yeah. All right. Yeah, and I saw your, your comment earlier that, um, Jocelyn, that this demonstrates that, you know, you can recognize that the students are not just a blank slate and they, they bring valuable experience that they can build on. I think that that's a really important aspect with this as well. Um, great. Yes, and I'll be sharing my slides. Wonderful. <laughs> all right so I don't know so if you can't if there are no questions now like I said please feel free uh to email me uh at any point I love talking about this stuff uh if you have an idea for for any kind of lesson plan that kind of uses some of these ideas I'd love to hear about it um you know, or be even be sort of somebody you can bounce ideas off of. I'm always open to that. So, All right. If there's no more questions, um, I just want to thank you again, Allison, for your presentation, and thank you all presenters that are still here to for your time and expertise and sharing your ideas. Um, I saw a lot of presenters have already emailed me their slides. Uh, if you haven't already, please do e email them to me. I will spread them out to all registrants. And um, unless anyone else had anything they wanted to share before I turn this off. Um, um, I did see one question from Anna. Uh, she says, uh, do you talk about student learning outcomes in your book? I'm going to be really honest. That's probably an area that I don't talk about as much as I probably should have. Um, uh, I don't talk specifically about student learning outcomes, but it's something that um, I'm definitely thinking about a lot more. And I'd like to hopefully explore explore this more with student learning outcomes in the future. But yeah, that's a really great question. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for, like I said, sticking around.